let's start here. You just got back from Hong Kong? <laughs> yes, I just got back from Hong Kong. So if I sound less than um, together, it's because of that. Uh, yeah, we were doing some events in Beijing and Hong Kong. Um, it was just amazing. So if you start dozing off, it's not because I'm boring you. Right. It's jet lag, right? Like legit. I will say it's all jet lag. Um, we'll say. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay, so you were doing some Some, some events. events, we would. Yeah. You, we had a couple of uh, former chefs uh, that settled in Asia, one in Beijing. He was originally from Beijing, um, but he came and worked with us for a while and then moved back to Beijing. Okay. And then another one of our chefs um, worked with us and then settled in Hong Kong. Wow. And uh, so we've been talking about this for a couple of years. And then I had to be in Hong Kong for some meetings at the end of this last week. And so I said, let's put together this thing. So we uh, visited Shanghai, then went to Beijing, and then ended up in Hong Kong. Um, amazing things going on there. Man, I'm sorry your life is so boring. I know. I'm it's really so sorry boring. About that. <laughs> I just sit around and twiddle my thumbs. Yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, so what... I mean, what is the time difference that you're trying to... 14 adjust? hours ahead. Okay, so they're already in tomorrow. Okay? Oh, I can't... My mind doesn't work I know, it's really hard to imagine. <laughs> and that. so every night when I would, before I would go to bed, I would got, get in contact with people back here because they were just getting up. And okay. so you kind of think about it on those terms, but it's hard to keep it in your head. So at some point you are going to lay down and take a nap, right? right? <laughs> I, well, maybe not until tonight. I've got a lot more work to do. Good Lord. Okay. Um, so, I mean, we know you. We've got, like, your resume is, like, three miles long, right? Well, that's because I'm really old. Uh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I'm actually, I'm starting <laughs> to get into this. You cannot say you're old. Come Listen, on. <laughs> I, like, well, in, in the music business, they want you to, you know, everybody to be 23. Uh -huh, of course. You know? Of course, yes. So, like, oh, my God, if you hit 40, yeah. you're basically a fossil. I know. We're like, now I'm like, I love I love being 40. Like, I love <laughs> it. I want to tell everybody about it. I'm, I'm like, owning it that I'm older. So, getting Good. older is such a privilege. Yeah. It, it has a couple of drawbacks, but I will tell you, the wisdom that you gain along the way is worth everything. A hundred percent. And also, let's not pretend that the world didn't see you doing your Pilates inverted split thing on Instagram the other day. I <laughs> I'm saw happy it. to hear you saw that. <laughs> I'm proud of being able to do that at my age. So. Yeah, listen, I would be proud to do that at my age. Mm -hmm. I don't think that I could, so job well done, sir. I like that. I like <laughs> that. Um, yeah, I like to do all the acrobatic things. I'm really into yoga. I've been doing yoga for 25 years, and I like to do all the acrobatic things in yoga, too. I, I will tell you, I like to look at the world um, from an upside-down perspective, um, because I, I feel like that we just get too much in a rut. And when I can go upside down, I start looking at everything really different. And there was a period of my life for about um, probably about 10 years, I did handstands every day and I got super good at it. Then I had a shoulder injury and oh. I'm, I'm working back to getting upside down that way. I can do my headstands, but I can't do my handstands. So that you can just get like a, a different perspective? But yes, I like to look at the world upside down because I think it's really it's really fun. It makes it gets you out of your normal way of thinking about things. It's not a Batman thing. It's not. It's just a really great way of seeing new possibilities. Wow. So I think that your mind and this is just a wild guess, but maybe wired that way to want to see more and experience more because it is. When I hear stories about like, oh, you fell in love with Mexican culture and food when you were 14, all my brain could think of was, and yes, that's incredible, but like, how does a 14-year-old talk his family into going to Mexico City on vacation <laughs> before like TripAdvisor or what, you know what I mean? Before How'd everything, everything. No, back in those days, our family had never gotten on an airplane for a vacation. It was really rare to get on an airplane. And back in those days, you had to have a real reason to do that. And I convinced my family that we should go to Mexico City for this. We closed our family restaurant one week a year. And so I convinced them that we needed to go to Mexico City. My parents were not adventurous. And so it's really remarkable that I convinced him of that. For sure. Then at 14, I booked all of the hotels and the, or 
we stayed in one place. Yeah. But the hotel, I booked the airline reservations and all of that, planned the entire itinerary. But I, I have a vagabond's heart. I was born with a vagabond's heart, even though I didn't get to travel um, it, very much at all until I was 14. That was sort of what started it. And then eventually I ended up uh, living in Mexico and um, I got a chance to start traveling around the world. But that really came much later in my life. But I, I, I really value being a citizen of the world, meaning you, you're not a you're, you're not a tourist, you're a traveler. You go to places for two reasons. One, to see the potential that life has in store. And secondly, to, to get a mirror, to find your, to see yourself better. When you travel outside your own culture, you start seeing yourself in a new way, in a more complete way. But I also just am super curious about how human beings develop their culture and their food and how they maneuver through the day and that's what you see when you when you visit places not as a tourist like on a tourist route or something but really get deep into the the culture and that's why this last trip that I was on where we were doing events in Beijing and in Hong Kong that's my jam man I like to get into people's kitchens into their restaurant kitchens and see how they do things how do they tackle this problem how do they when the the tickets come in from the dining room how do they make the food who do, how do they divide things up how does it get out to the guest again and that sort of thing is really fascinating to me so we got to do that in two different places so okay let, let me ask you this because you will know better I think than anybody um and, and we've talked about this on the show before that every different culture kind of says like, oh, we, you know, food is love and, and we love to feed oh, right. our people. Right? Yeah. Everybody, yeah. everybody kind of owns that. So whether you're coming from an Italian family or, yeah. or Latino or whatever, right. um, you know, my family is, is mostly Polish. So we're all like, oh, of course we're going to eat, eat, eat. But I think everybody does that. Has yes. That food I think you find thing. that everywhere in right. the world. Yes. Right. And that's one of the reasons I enjoy traveling so much because I like to get a sense of that love. And uh, I'm really into street food in a lot of places that I go to. And when you find that street food um, vendor that makes that one, two, maybe three dishes max. Okay. And they do it with their whole heart. And they're so proud of having perfected that dish or those dishes. It is so cool because they just emanate that kind of love for what they're doing. Give me an example of of a street food that you just fell in love with. Well, I will tell you that we, my wife and I have an apartment in Mexico City. And our first time going to that apartment. It was in a new building. I wanted to get an apartment in a new building because I wanted to put in a kitchen that um, I could bring our staff to and we could really cook at sort of the restaurant level. And nobody's got a kitchen like that in a small apartment in right. Mexico City. So we built one. And the first day I went into this apartment, um, when we first, like it was unveiled to us, um, we were really hungry, my wife and I, and we had nothing in the apartment and I said I'm just going to go to the street vendors down the block half a block away and there was this woman there and she was making things with the fresh corn masa the same dough that's used to make tortillas and she was making these different shapes these tlacoyos and huaraches and, and um, tetelas and she was making all this beautiful stuff with the precision of a famous French chef when you see them do their dicing and mincing and all that sort of stuff. She was, had the, was bringing the same precision to that. And I watched her practiced hands make these things. And then I took them back to our apartment and bit into them and it everything was so exquisite. I had to go back down to her and say, Oh my God, the love you pour into that dish. The, and it was cheap street food. I mean, it was just pennies. Yeah, with, but it was good. But it was good. And it was done with such love and care and knowledge and talent. Yeah. I mean, all of that stuff was going into it. And I just had to go back down and tell her how beautiful her food was. And she looked at me sort of like, oh, really? 
I, I just do what I like. And I just, I was taken with that. <laughs> and to me that wow. I've never forgotten that. Yeah. One. Oh my gosh. So we're, we're celebrating what is 37 years. Yeah. It's a, it's a weird, I know Chicago. it's a weird number to celebrate, but it means something to me because I will tell you that I grew up in a restaurant that was this wonderful barbecue restaurant yeah. that made all these different meats. Uh, in Chicago, we tend to think of barbecue restaurants as very simple and small menus, mm -hmm. but this was a restaurant that had 30 different sides all made from scratch wow. and all these different barbecued meats. So I grew up with that, with the pride of cooking regional food and because barbecue in Oklahoma, where I grew up, is the regional food. Yeah. So I grew up with that intense pride and care and all that sort of stuff. So I just, I, I resonate with that wherever I find it in the, in the world. So, but the 37 years. Oh, the 37 years. What, because it, that, that, is that kind of in that, in that restaurant, um, that I grew up in, I mean, literally grew up in it because I loved being there. And so I spent every waking moment that I could, um, in the restaurant, it lasted 37 years. And oh, so, um, now that landmark that my parents set for me is now a landmark that I have achieved too. Congratulations. And so I'm super proud of it. And I know it's a weird number, but that's, that's what we're doing. Listen, it's an impressive number because, <laughs> yeah. you know, you rarely stay, do restaurants yeah, last that stay long. Stay open that long yeah. and loved that yes. long. You know, that is a huge accomplishment. I'm very proud of it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you've been able to open so many other places here in town yeah. and what I think is, is curious, I guess it occurred to me because I've been in my head as to, okay, 37 years ago, what was, River North was not the River North that we know it. So can we yeah, talk about that? Okay, so. Um, <laughs> River North 37 years ago. I, I wanted to put a place as close to downtown as I could afford. Yeah. And we could afford to be in River North, which was not called River North then it wasn't called anything because nobody really wanted to be there because it was nothing but cheap bars and porno shops. Right. That's it my was understanding. really, really scuzzy. Okay. I mean, really scuzzy. Some sketch, but. And so it's, it is really <laughs> funny that it has become what it's become now. And, and all the restaurants, we, we laugh and call it the gourmet getter because there's so <laughs> many great restaurants there. Yeah. So that's what it has become. But for the first 10 years that we were there, I'll say, um, it was really sketchy. People used to call up and say, there's a parking lot across the street, but is it safe to walk across the street? Yeah. And we would just laugh at them and say, of course, it's safe to walk across the street. So then how long after getting started did you really start to see the neighborhood change? Because even in saying 30 or 37 years, th that is a huge difference in, yeah. in the neighborhood change. Um, we didn't see much change in that neighborhood almost for 10 years. Okay. So it was a really scuzzy neighborhood. But we had a really famous restaurant, Kitty Corner from Ours, and it was uh, called Gordon. It hasn't been there for a while. Haleo's in that space right now. Before that, it was a restaurant, a really good restaurant called Naha. But um, the Gordon restaurant was there for 21 years. Okay. And it was a high-end fine dining restaurant. But people took taxis there they rarely i mean they they had valet parking which we didn't have when we first opened um which made it harder for people to feel comfortable coming to visit us but i will tell you that that we could say we were adjacent to gordon restaurant and people would say okay well if you're close enough to them i guess it's an okay neighborhood <laughs> to go to but it was considered to be very sketchy yeah well you know what now I don't even want to try to park my car in River. No, North. you so don't. It's That's like, the it's thing. Fine. Now it's we just switch it for Ubers. It went, yeah, and which is a smart thing to do because parking is really hard, but yeah. not as hard as over in the West Loop. How West, about it? West Loop is just impossible. Fulton Market, West Loop area. Yeah. I'm just kind of like, just drop me from the sky. Yes, I don't know. I know it's super hard. How to get around over there? And I don't know why they've allowed that much density of restaurants without requiring that there be a lot of parking lots over there. And that's the thing too, is that like so many people from the suburb, I'm in the suburbs now. So 
like I have my car. I have my wheels with me no matter what, you know? So I don't want to park here at the station and then Uber there and then come back here to get my car. I'm like, that is such a pain in the ass (laughs) to get over there. But it's, there's all of those restaurants just lined up up and down Randolph, all that. I don't know. Um, Maybe they think everybody lives in the city within walking distance. Well, and a lot of people do over there in the West Loop. And so, and a lot of their clientele lives in that neighborhood. They're about to get a strongly worded email from me after this, just to be clear. (laughs) Um, Okay, so we've got the the huge anniversary. Um, Are we talking about the 21st? You want to talk about what March 21st is? I don't want to talk about it, but if you want to talk about it, that's okay. Listen, I want to talk about it only if you're comfortable being like, by the way, it's. It, Chef Rick Bayless Day. I it's a big deal. I can't really say it without blushing. It sounds really silly okay, to me. Well, but anyway, yes, the city too, has declared it, it that. Okay. Yeah, I think I think that's really just such a cool thing because Chicago's not a middle of nowhere place. It is a big deal, and to be honored with a day that is all about you, your accomplishments, and what you're doing moving forward is kind of a big deal. I think. I'm I'm very honored. Yeah. I'm just uncomfortable saying it out loud myself. Okay. No problem. We'll put it in the caption. Okay. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> no big deal. Um, well, maybe this is something you might be a little bit more uncomfortable talking about. Um, I've started to do a little bit of reading about, um, I think, the agriculture assistance that you have been offering for so long. Yeah, we've been doing that for over 20 years now. Yeah. So it, can we talk a little bit about that, what that looked like when you started, what that looks like moving forward? Um, I ask mainly from a selfish place because my, my dad has a farm. Mm-hmm. I am so interested in that and to, to have somebody else show interest. Well, um, we got started really cool. in giving assistance to some small farmers when uh, one of our farmers brought in some beautiful spinach in the middle of February. And I said, how in the world do you get this? He was a Wisconsin farmer. And he said, well, I grow it in an unheated hoop house. And I said, oh, don't tell any other chef about this this product that you have. I want it all. I want everything you can grow. But you're not even growing enough to supply our restaurant. So I, I, he said, oh, no, I can't grow anymore. In, you know, we planted it one time of the year. Then we harvest it through the winter months. Um, and I said, well, what would it take for you to put in another hoop house so that we could have more of this spinach during the winter? And he goes, oh, it'd take me five years to be able to save enough money right, to put money. in another <laughs> uh, hoop house. And I said to him, it's like, what if we lent you the money? You put the hoop house in and then you paid us back in spinach. And that got us started down this road. And we realized that many of our farmers could be way more productive if they had the resources to in their farms to be more productive. It was just the resources that they were lacking. So we started this no interest loan program um, about 25 years ago where we would lend them money to do some improvement and they could pay us back in a crop if they wanted to. And that worked really well for about five years. Then we decided to turn it into a not-for-profit, a 501c3, raise money at the restaurant and then distribute that money to people who gave us grant applications. So for 20 years, we've been doing it as a not-for-profit and we've invested about 3.3 three million dollars in local farms over that period of time because our customers are very generous people and so once a year we do a big fundraiser and we raise up all the money that we are going to distribute that that year and then small farmers it's all got to be family farms um, they make grant applications to us and then we usually award around 18 20 of them a year and wow. you know what the the sad thing is? Mm. No, it's not sad. It's a great thing, but it's remarkable that all they need is ten to twelve, maybe fifteen thousand yeah. dollars to make improvements that are going to make them so much more productive and therefore more profitable. And it's not a huge investment. Like it's doable. It's doable. Yeah. And so that most of the the 
grants that we give are between ten and fifteen thousand dollars because that's what they need. They need to buy a new tractor. They need a down payment for that, or they need to put in a watering system, or they need to upgrade something on their tractor. You know, it's just anything like that that they that they need. Or sometimes it's just a delivery vehicle. They want to invest in a delivery vehicle that's air conditioned so that they can right. move their stuff to a farmer's market and sell it there. Yeah, yeah. I just, I think I'm super appreciative of it. I'm from a farming family. Yep. Um, you know, not not growing the business because my parents are retired, you know, and not trying to build it. My brothers are still trying to, you know, farm what they can. We're still trying to uh, But I will our say that a it. lot of the family farms are either sort of going out of business because the parents, grandparents are retiring and Mm -hmm. nobody's taking it over in the family. But a lot of the farms we invest in are new farms that are young families that are moving into it. And we really want to see them succeed because if they succeed, they'll stay on the land and it won't get gobbled up by, you know, suburban sprawl. For sure. And for me, I guess growing up in Chicago, I mean, summer's at the farm, but thinking about Farmers markets were like not around. They're no. everywhere now. They're everywhere That's- now. When we opened Frontera 37 years ago, there were no farmers markets in the right. city of Chicago. That didn't come until uh, about 92, 93, something like that. Okay. So uh, I was very interested in getting local product in our restaurants because I had learned living in Mexico that you can't have a vibrant restaurant community without really vibrant local agriculture. And we didn't have vibrant local agriculture back then. You had to drive out into the country and stop at a farm stand yeah. to get locally grown vegetables Anything, and, yeah. and 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 fruits. And so we decided that we really wanted to develop that. So we helped to sponsor those first farmers markets and to get people to buying the local stuff. So the farmers would continue to come into Chicago. And now they're ever those farmers markets are everywhere. They're everywhere. They're like people's weekend plans. Yes. Like that's what they're going to do. And on we're Sunday. happy about that. Now I want to say to everybody listening to this, um, if you go to your farmers markets and you buy enough vegetables for Saturday night or Sunday night dinner, that's not enough. You need to also plan those vegetables to stretch into Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, because that's what's going to keep the farmers in business. And I I live right by the Wicker Park Farmers Market on Sunday morning, and I see a lot of the young couples coming in and just buying enough fruits and vegetables to put on the table that night. But think more broadly than that. Stock up. (laughs) Stock up. Okay, so what, let's, let's talk about this. What do we need to have stocked at home? Whether it's from the farmer's market, from the, any market, like, what do you think? I, I'm someone who either I have a full fridge or it is completely, completely empty. empty. <laughs> like if the yeah. apocalypse falls on a day I'm not prepared for, I am no. in trouble. Okay. So like, what do I need to have at home? Um, well, everybody's got different tastes and, um, everybody's going to nourish themselves in a very different way. If you want to know what I have in my refrigerator all the time. Okay. So potatoes and onions and garlic are always in my refrigerator because those can be the start of something. If I have to throw together a meal really fast, I could do it with that. I always have eggs. Because you can make something that's really delicious with those things that I just mentioned, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, really delicious, really something good. Um, I always have an herb plant, okay? And I'm going to encourage everybody to do this. Okay. If you have a south-facing window, get yourself a rosemary plant because they're very hardy. Put them outside during, on. if you don't have a yard, you could put it out on your, your landing or your porch during the summertime. Bring it in. It just needs sun. That's all. And it'll do fine over the winter as long as you water it properly. But watering it for rosemary plants is really easy. Just drench it really good once a week and it'll be fine. Okay, so that I always like fresh herbs will make your food so much more exciting. And so rosemary is a good thing to have. I'm like beaming right now. 
Because I have a rosemary. You do. <laughs> I do. Oh, I, I chose the right thing. I, then. I, I okay. Mean, yeah, nailed it. Nailed uh, okay. It. Um, okay. Only then, because my boyfriend's like, we need to have this. Yes. And so we do. And have you do. This. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And but then, I'm like, nailed it. And then it's a kind of interesting <laughs> thing. I always keep something green in my refrigerator. Okay. Um, and the things that will last the longest are. <laughs> Kale, that dinosaur kale, the good one to eat, not the roughly kale. <laughs> right. Okay. So dinosaur kale and broccoli. It's Those, called dinosaur? It's called dinosaur or um, sometimes it's called Tuscan kale. Okay. Or dinosaur. there's, there's a whole concerns. bunch of different <laughs> names for it. Um, black kale is another name for it. But anyway, that stuff lasts really long. Okay. And what I do is I put it in a quart container. I just kind of push it in there, seal it up, put it in the refrigerator. And the fact that it, there's no air circulation around it will keep it from going bad much faster. Okay. okay. It won't dry out and get awful. Same thing for the broccoli. I cut it in florets, put it into a one quart container, put a top on it and put it in the refrigerator and it will last a, a week longer than anything. So I always want to have something green in my refrigerator. I always have Greek yogurt in my refrigerator. Same. Um, butter, of course, and because <laughs> I like butter. And um, let's see, uh, citrus, I always have some limes and lemons um, because um, I'm sort of an aficionado of the cocktail camp. And so that gives me a lot of possibilities to do different kinds of cocktails. Okay, so are, you, are I'm, you shaking or are you stirring? Well, if it's got citrus in it, you're shaking, okay? okay? If it's a sort of boozy, you know, Manhattan, uh, uh, old-fashioned old fashioned. type, then that's a stirred cocktail, okay? okay? okay. Um, so those are the basics that I have in my refrigerator at all time. I always have bacon in the freezer, and I buy bacon. And then I put it into small little packages and freeze it so that I can pull them out. Because if you ever need to flavor a dish, cutting up bacon and cooking it real fast, it'll give, you can do like vegetarian. <laughs> this is stupid, I know. <laughs> but it's like, if you could take a vegetarian dish and throw a little bacon in it. And it just, it's <laughs> so delicious. So I always have bacon for that. I make fried rice with bacon and egg in it yes. all the time oh. and stuff like that. And every time I make rice, um, I, I'm a fan of a rice cooker. So I, and I, I like to make all kinds of food, but um, I tend to go to Chinese food a fair amount. And so um, I will always cook rice in a rice cooker for that. And then I'll take the leftover rice and I'll put that in the freezer so that I can pull that out and make fried rice anytime I need to. Smart. I'm a very, very um, uh, efficient cook, okay? And my wife always says, oh, there's this little bit of this leftover, so should I just throw it out? And I'm, no, no, but save that, because I can fix yeah, it. Turn in, that into I something. can turn it into something. I can put it in my fried rice if yeah. I do that. Or if we get home late, and she says, I'm really hungry, and I can say, I'm 20, give me 20 minutes, and I'll have something on the table. Because I have these things already squirreled away in my refrigerator or in my pantry. So I'll tell you that just as someone who is constantly thinking about food, but mostly about eating it, not about cooking it, <laughs> um, I, I will have in my mind like, I would like to, I would like to eat that later. So are you thinking I would like to try to cook that later? Oh, for sure. Okay. okay. I'm always um, squirreling away things that like I come across. You know, I, I know a lot of people say going to the grocery store is their least favorite activity. It's my most, my favorite activity in the whole wide world. And in fact, my wife hates when I go to the grocery store by myself because it may take me an hour and a half to get out of the, the grocery store only because I'm going through every aisle and I'm reading labels and I'm looking at things yeah. and all that. But one of my favorite activities on a Sunday afternoon is to go to Chinatown and go to the market there and see what's there. And that's when I'll buy a few things and then I'll start to think about, um, I don't know how to cook with this thing. So I'll do a little research and find a recipe. And then that's the way I keep fresh. And what I do is that I'm always cooking with new things. Have you been to the new, the, the Gangnam the, market over in uh, West loop? The West loop. one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've been to that. Um, I only went there once, but then the really 
big. That one's kind of a flashy one. Yeah. But yeah. the the one the, the new one down um, north of Chinatown, a little bit eighty eight Marketplace. I love that place, but it's like a whole football field, and you have to know you what you want when you go in because otherwise you'll just get lost in it. And I made the um, mistake the first time that I went there the weekend before Chinese New Year, and it was such mayhem. I bet. But it was fun, <laughs> and I enjoyed sort of exploring it. I didn't come out with very much because I just kept getting sidetracked and all of that. Anyway, they also, at 88, they have a really, really good food court. Oh, nice. Um, and so you can there. go in there and, and eat. It's it's a it's a it's an interesting place, but it's a really sort of delving into the culture as well as the food. I get kind of overwhelmed when I go to a market that is too big too like big, that. Yeah. I get overwhelmed. I need to go to, I, we used to go to a couple of them along Dempster um, uh-huh. and just go, and I'm like, I don't even know what this is. Let's just buy it and see, and see, yeah, what, and happens, see what it is. You know, yeah, figure <clears throat> it out. There's a lot of really good Middle Eastern markets there on Dempster. On Dempster? Yeah, yeah. I've been up to, to go through those a few. And oddly enough, and I'm not going to remember the exact name of this place, but over on... On the uh, western side of the loop, but not all the way to West Loop, um, there's a really good Indian market over there. So if you just Google Indian market loop, it'll come up. Okay. It's really, really good. Not they too use, big? It's not too big. Okay. Well, th- when you said that, you, you get overwhelmed because I'm the same way. Um, but this market used to be super tiny, and they didn't have... Um, a full range of things, but they've moved in the last couple of years, and now it's a really good market. And the fact that it's downtown, well, H Mart is downtown right. too, and I love stopping at H Mart yeah. because they have not only Chinese stuff like you'll find over at 88, but um, they have all kinds of Indian stuff and Korean stuff and and uh, Japanese. H Mart. There is an H Mart though. I think it up in Niles. Right? The Niles far, is the big one. Of, yeah, that's that's, that's that a really huge. big one. Yeah. That this one is very compact. The one that's on Jackson. Okay. And I love going to that one. I been there and yet. that oh, you should go. And it's got a parking lot. Amazing. <laughs> it's really Sold. really great. I <laughs> highly recommend that place. Okay. Cool. And they have a very small food court in that one. But it's but it's good. I've eaten food there too. Okay. One of my favorite things is to go to these places and then have lunch there. Yeah. Because it gives you Same. <laughs> something else to eat, you yeah. know? Yeah. Well, you've got some big stuff coming up. Um you've got the ticket of dinner. Ticket of dinner on the twenty first. So on the um uh what shall we call what it? Are, what are we the, calling what are that we day? calling it? It's the um alleged Rick Bayless Day yeah. on the 21st. You can say it. It's all about me. Okay. Go it's ahead. Not, own it. It's not all about <laughs> it's me. All about it's all about making good food for people. And so we are I'm doing... i to make you blush right now. You, you, well, you look at me. <laughs> Here it is that I'm all red in the face. Um, the I will say that it's a really fun... It was a fun thing for us to do to go back to our original menus oh. and resurrect all this stuff. Nice. And so we're doing a whole dinner of what, what did Frontera taste like in its early incarnation. So, oh, that's cool. Um, so we're doing a dinner for that to celebrate our 37th year. Yeah, that is massive. And congratulations. Uh, thank you very much. I'm I'm really, really proud of that. I'm proud of, to say that I came from a family that had a restaurant for 37 years and did really traditional food. And my wife and I have had that restaurant for 37 years doing traditional food, but a different tradition. Yeah. Hey, if you're going to fall in love with a culture, yeah. I, I mean, I do love Mexican culture. Half of my family is Mexican. Yeah. I get it. I've spent all day the day before Christmas. You're making tamales. My, <laughs> yes, my tamales I know. For like hours till yeah, my back yeah. hurts. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So um, I get it. And I love your appreciation for it too. Yeah. Anything else you want to tell me that you got coming down the pipeline here? Mm. I'm always working on books, okay? So I've got a couple more in the pipeline right now. Um, I decided that nine cookbooks wasn't enough, so I'm working (laughs) on a couple more. But um, there is another aspect of what we do at Frontera and Topolo Bampo and Shoko and Bar Sotano, all four restaurants that are stuck together there on Clark Street. Um, But um, my wife and I are really passionate about Mexican art. And so for 40 some years, we have been collecting Mexican art. And our 
walls in the restaurants are just covered with mostly Oaxacan artists from the southern part of Mexico because it's, I guess, for my wife and I, um, it's our favorite place. It's the place in Mexico that we resonate with most. And um, we have this large collection, okay, 150 pieces or something like that. And we move it around and we put some of it in storage and we change it from time to time in the restaurant. But we decided that we were going to put together a book of our collection. And so that is going to come out just in another week or so. And that book coincides with a special menu that we're doing in Topolobampo. Oh. So in our fine dining restaurant, the one that has the Michelin star, um, we, we do themed menus. And we tell you a story through food. I love that. And this menu that's coming up is a story uh, through food and art. So every dish is inspired by a piece of art. And so we have now put together a collection um, of uh, our most famous pieces in in our collection in this book. And at the back of the book, there's these really beautiful pages where you've got a piece of art and you've got a dish right next to it. So it shows you how we think about food as it relates to art. So not only do you get the biographies of all of these amazing artists and and examples of their work, but you also get a little example of our art in the restaurant and how we are inspired by these beautiful works of art that hang on the walls. Art you can eat. Art, now this is art you can you eat. You are speaking my language. Yes, all now. right. <laughs> when does that come out? It comes out next week. Oh, soon. Yeah, okay. really, really, really soon. Wow. Does yeah. your brain ever just rest? No. Okay. I'm, I'm a curious person. If you ask me, what's my ideal vacation it would be to go to some other country and explore their cuisine that's what i find really relaxing and innovating at the same time i i really love i'm just a really curious person so my relaxation is going to be to investigate something that's what i do for fun yeah like in my mind my vacation is like i want to go to a beach i want to lay there for 10 hours and do nothing but and for me, that's my think, definition of hell. Really? <laughs> it actually is. I'm not a beach person. I don't like to sit still. Yeah. But if you tell me we're going to go on a hike, I'll say, ah, oh, that would be great. Let's go. Okay. See, I didn't see, <laughs> I didn't see that coming from you. I, I guess I imagined that you would be like, sure, let's go to the beach. I'm going to round up 50 people and we're going to cook a whole animal and we're going to well, throw a party. Yeah, I could do that. I could do that. Like, or that I would seems... I would say to find a fisherman, let's go fishing, and okay. then we're going to build a fire on the beach, and then we're going to put together some way to roast this whole fish yeah. or something like that. I would do that. Yeah. Yes, that would be fun for me. But if if you ask me just to sit still and say, and people tell me this all the time, say, so you need to slow down and just rest. And I say, you can do that when you die. Right. <laughs> We're all going to do that eventually. <laughs> um, no, I love it. I love the energy. And and let's be honest, I can't really sit still. She's known me for over 20 years, and she is fully aware of that, too. So, like, I get it, and, and I respect it. And, um, man, I just think it's so damn impressive to see you, like, going and doing all that you're doing and oh, have it's been fun. for so long. It's, it's really fun. cool. It's fun to me. I think life is just has so many opportunities and possibilities, and I want to explore them all. I mean, we're here for it. We're here yeah. for it. Thank you for being here with us. Today. Oh, it's my pleasure to have this conversation. Like I, I told you on the elevator on the way up, I was like, man, I am out of breath. I'm so excited to meet oh, you. That, so. that makes me so happy. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for being here.